Just to kick things off, when I, when I look at uh, an individual's background, I always look for things that might be you know, useful in the jobs that, uh, that they have. And Congressman Thompson is, uh, is a community leader, a volunteer firefighter, so I think that'll come in very, very handy. And there are times it feels like we're on fire. And uh, <laughs> Congressman uh, Fazio is uh, a community leader as well, uh, has uh, done a lot of work in heroin epidemic and Lyme disease, as well as small business and uh, health insurance. So I think those definitely uh, will be helpful. So if you take a minute to uh, say a few words. Sure, well thank you very much. Uh, I really uh, appreciate the opportunity the invitation to be here. This is a very exciting forum where uh, uh, as I've looked at so many individuals from, uh, from a futures perspective, specifically with infrastructure, have come together uh, I know we're sitting in an amphitheater, but actually my vision of, of coming to the table, and that's so incredibly important. I, I really did want to take a, a few minutes uh, or a minute to, or so to, to some of my thoughts on the state of the infrastructure, uh, specific, specifically my thoughts on expanding capacity in rural America, because I represent the Pennsylvania 5th Congressional District. There's 18 seats in Pennsylvania. I represent 24% of the land mass. They give you some idea of the rural nature of uh, of the district, and um, and I'm, first thing I want, I want to thank uh, Meg Lauerman, who uh, has been a friend for uh, a long time, uh, who was uh, with Continental One for really inviting me, extending the invitation to participate this morning. Uh, she's been a strong ad advocate and has helped uh, really helped many people set their eyes on the future um, about sharing a vision of an interior north south freight and and commerce corridor spanning from the Canadian uh, border to. Uh, to Florida, and uh, uh, this uh, this little project, and I, I, I use that uh, with uh, italics, I guess, is uh, is probably been named Continental One, and I really do want to thank uh, CG and LA for, uh, for the opportunity to be among uh, such esteemed guests. Uh, and, uh, I know uh, some folks from the White House uh, last evening um, that, that you were talking about, and and our, our Secretary Transportation Secretary Lane Chow and and my colleagues from both the House and the Senate. Um, the, uh, you know, infrastructure is uh, in incredibly important. Uh, it is about the, the future. In fact, the, the big ticket items we're working on right now are all about the future. They're all interlocked. We have to dispense and deal with each one. Uh, healthcare, tax reform, and infrastructure. But it is about, these are all based on providing a better future to, to some extent. I was talking to Norman this morning. It is re really about rep replenishing the plate of our children and grandchildren of what we have uh, um, um, diminished, you know, as opposed to leaving them with an empty plate in debt. This is an opportunity to, in a transformational way, to, to serve these, uh, these future generations. Um, we, um, uh, you know, Pennsylvania has two eastern corridors, I-95 and I-81, and several viable east-west corridors, such as Interstate 80, which a great deal of that goes through my congressional district. There really is a serious need for the western portion of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania to have a north-south corridor, and that's why in other states have, uh, have seen, certainly seem to have the same dilemma of taking interest in alleviating congestion in their north-south routes and have taken interest in and the possibilities of what economic development in north-south route could bring to rural areas. Um, soon after my first election, which was in 2008, uh, I was introduced to Continental One and which shared with me a great plan to create an enhanced and more efficient infrastructure system from Toronto to Miami. And the Corridor One, uh, cor Continental One Corridor really aims to stretch from Toronto, traversing eight states, including New York, and New York's done a great job. Uh, with those investments, uh, uh, much better than Pennsylvania. Um, and I, I don't usually admit that lightly. Uh, 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 West Virginia, Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, and Florida to conclude Miami. And the four-lane highway will cross a line of two major U.S. rail carriers, 14 S arterial interstate highways, and creating critical inland access to all major uh, East Coast air and, and uh, and maritime. It just, it's just an example of a great project done. Uh, it'll be facilitated in a public part private partnership, I believe, the best way to do that. Um, and it's so incredibly important, not just for efficient transportation, but to move the economy. As uh, I'm not on the Transportation Infrastructure uh, Committee, 
but I am vice chair of the Agriculture Committee, which is focused on uh, my on-written mission for the Agriculture Committee is to have a rural, uh, the, the economy of rural America to be robust. And to do that, we need great infrastructure, not just highways like Continental One, but obviously our, our ports, uh, our, our locks, our canals, our, um, you know, our airports, uh, you know, just across the board to be able to move, move that economy. And so just uh, very appreciative to be invited to, to, to be here this morning, to be a, a part of this process. Thank you. Congressman Johnson. Good morning, I'm John Faso. I represent the 19th Congressional District in upstate New York. Uh, my district stretches from, northern, from Vermont on the northeast portion to Pennsylvania in the southwest, uh, covering parts or all of 11 counties in the Mid-Hudson and Catskills. I have uh, President Roosevelt's home in Hyde Park. Martin Van Buren, our eighth president in my hometown, Kinderhook, New York. Uh, his estate there, but we also have the Baseball Hall of Fame and, and the Woodstock. Uh, I not only have Woodstock, but I also have the place 40 miles away in Sullivan County in Bethel, New York, where the Woodstock concert actually occurred. And we still have some people who are in, living in Woodstock who came for the concert and never left. Uh, but it's, it's great to be here with G.T. Thompson, uh, who is a leader uh, on our Agriculture Committee. Uh, I am privileged to serve as a member of the subcommittee that uh, GT chairs as well on agriculture, uh, but I am also on the infrastructure and transportation, transportation infrastructure committee, as well as being on the budget committee. And the nice thing about agriculture and transportation, they're very bipartisan. Budget, on the other hand, is not. Uh, and we're going through the fiscal uh, 18 uh, budget uh, process right now, and it, it's a difficult one. Infrastructure, I think everyone is focused on it. It's an area where there should be bipartisan support, and I think there will be. The real rub is, where do you get the money? And on my budget committee hat, I can tell you, the CBO told us uh, a few months ago, that our present national debt is 19 trillion, and we're scheduled to go to, hold your, onto your seats, 29 trillion in just 10 years. A $10 trillion, and it's hard to get your arms around trillions, but 10 trillion, dollar increase in the debt in just 10 years. But there's also a consensus that if we're going to grow the economy, we have to reform health care, we've got to um, uh, have a tax reduction and a tax reform, particularly one that allows our multinational companies to bring back to the United States overseas profits without being taxed twice. But we also have to rebuild infrastructure. And one of the projects that is vitally important to the Northeast Corridor that I uh, and privileged to represent, is the Gateway Project. We must build these twin tunnels between New Jersey and New York. Um, the, the entire Northeast rail transportation and the, and the economic uh, situation in New York depends on it. Uh, just to give you an idea, uh, New York City, the, the New York State Metropolitan Transportation Authority, um, one third of all the people that use mass transit in the United States of America on a daily basis travel the New York City MTA, the, the uh, Metro North Railroad, the Long Island Railroad, and New York City buses. It's an astonishing number. And if, if we don't have a, a good means of getting the, the trains in and out of Penn Station, in and out of Grand Central, uh, that affects my district 100 miles to the north and it affects the entire economy of the Northeast. And indeed, it, it will affect the, our national economy because so much of the growth and, and investment in, in our financial capital, New York City, is taking place there. So it's vitally important that we come up with the resources to build Gateway and build it in a way that it's not going to take a dozen years to plan and a dozen years to do the environmental and design work uh, to get it done. You know, in the depths of the Depression, they built the Empire State Building in 11 months. Today, you couldn't even get the plans approved in double that time. And that is, that is just a factor that we've got to confront. So, as we're looking at infrastructure, whether it's highway and bridge, whether it's uh, rail, whether it's airports, water and sewer, um, we've, got to, we've got to do it. And we've also got to come up with innovative ways of, of unle unlocking private sector capital so that it can be used to supplement what the taxpayers are coming up with. And of course, to get that private sector capital, you've got to have a project that is going to generate revenue, 
Uh, we see this in a lot of countries around the world, Australia, Canada. Um, GT knows we're looking at uh, a, a semi-private uh, privatized system to take over the air traffic control system in our country. In fact, our transportation committee is going to go up to Canada uh, in May, late May, to look at their system because it's, it's considered a model. So these are the things that we've got to do. We've got to find means of bringing private sector capital in. We've got to expedite planning and design and we've got to get working on these projects. And it's something that the American people, I think, want and expect us to do. And thankfully, it's something I think we can agree on on a bipartisan basis. GT and I are both Republicans, but we both know that uh, you've got to have bipartisan support to really move the country forward, and that's what we're hoping to accomplish. Thank you. And as someone who was, uh, in a previous life, responsible for operating the the Northeast Corridor, I can assure you we need gateway. If you lose any one of those two tubes today, it's just chaos. In New York and the impact, you lose one tube for 10 minutes, you lost the day. Right. And if it's, it's a really, really important uh, project. Well, we just saw uh, two weeks ago when there was a um, minor derailment, yeah. uh, New Jersey Transit in Penn Station. The havoc it costs for four days yeah. for hundreds of thousands of commuters every single day. And that, that's, that's loss of uh, efficiency, productivity, and money. So, so with that, let's just jump in and, and talk about probably, we heard it in the, in the previous piece on regulatory reform and uh, what Congress can do to ease the regulatory burden to get these projects done. Uh, um, one of my responsibilities uh, uh, also includes serving as a senior member on the Natural Resource Committee, and we deal a lot with uh, the permitting issue. Um, unfortunately, um, we, do, we do not have certainty, we do not have uh, efficiency uh, when projects progress at the speed of bureaucracy. And, and that's what we have with permitting today. And so some of the efforts, and, and we have been working for some time advancing legislation you know, for uh, at least uh, um, three terms now. And, uh, and I'm pleased to say, I think there's kind of a light at the end of the tunnel now that perhaps some of the product, the things that we've worked on, we may actually get to the desk of a president who I, I believe would eagerly sign. Um, and, and I'm not talking about skipping key uh, uh, permitting steps, but we're talking about getting things to work concurrently so that at the same time things move efficiently through the process. And yes, we do need to look at and ask ourselves what is absolutely necessary? You know, what, is, what does provide a return on investment? And I think it, it should be, be subject to scrutiny uh, to make sure that we're, um, you know, or, uh, we're the, you know, the, the permit itself, um, but then to have it done concurrently and with an expectation of uh, that government, um, that the, the, the regulators will work in, in good faith, uh, that there will be a, uh, there will not be the, the punitive police, but will be a partner in the process and to be able to help facilitate if there is an issue perhaps in a permit, not to take that application and put it at the bottom of the pile, but to help facilitate um, so that those who are applying or looking to make that investment to provide that certainty would, uh, um, you know, can, can um, to do that. I have seen a change. Uh, now it hasn't permeated the whole way yet, uh, at least what I've observed through the EPA and the Army Corps of Engineers. But I will say, so parting with a, uh, with an agency that had a, has a huge regulatory responsibilities, which is Department of Agriculture, kind of fits with the, some of the work we do in agriculture. For some time, USDA has moved to a, away from a punitive approach to a collaborative approach. And you know what, the outcomes are so much better. The efficiency is so much better. We've actually, we've actually delisted more species from an endangered species list, which can hold up project, infrastructure projects and what the Fish and Wildlife Service has done. Um, and most recently, I spent some time in the field with the Fish and Wildlife Service, and I'm pleased to say that that day was a, it was a different mindset last Monday. It was, they were talking collaboration. They were talking about voluntary conservation. They were talking about working with, with the key stakeholders. And, and uh, now I, I think that may have something to do with the fact we have a new sheriff in town. 
um, which, kind of was, you know, which, but the fact is they get better outcomes that way. Now I have not have had the, the opportunity yet to see that permeate uh, to the EPA or the Army Corps of Engineers, but that needs to happen. Congressman Faz, what are you seeing in this area in terms of regulatory reform and what's necessary in the future? Well, I think that uh, we, we, yes, we should expedite, we should try to streamline processes, uh, but let's also recognize that many of the uh, regulatory burdens are placed after something happens. We had a hearing in the Transportation Committee, the Rail Subcommittee, yesterday, and we were talking about the, the regulatory rule book that the nation's railroads operate under. And yes, there are many new technologies that we can use for electronic sensing to uh, expedite approvals and to actually do inspections. You don't necessarily have to have a physical inspector go out every time and look at something if you have electronic and other technological means to do the monitoring process. But let's face it, every time there's a a, a conductor that falls asleep and goes around the bend as the Metro North train did, that spawns a new set of, of CYA type regulation. And so all of these things started for some reason. I think the key here is to try to go in and review and update and modernize and use technology where we can uh, so that the regulatory process is more streamlined. But recognizing human nature being what it is, the bureaucracy, if something happens, the tendency is going to be to really clamp down on everyone going forward. That's just the way it works. Hopefully we can get a more reasonable regulatory pattern going, uh, to, particularly for large infrastructure product, projects today uh, that we want to get going. You know, I think we've found over and over again when they, with the Congress or the state legislatures or presidents and governors talk about shovel-ready, there is no such thing as shovel-ready because it, it's just, it just takes a process and takes time. And uh, we've got to just try to streamline it and expedite it as much as we can. And some of those uh, regulations, you know, one I'm familiar with is, you may not uh, know this, but every piece of track in the country, rail track, has to be walked and inspected every 72 hours. And um, when I was in my previous life at, at Amtrak, we had proposed to the FRA to use high rail vehicle, which is essentially a four-wheel drive on the, on the rails, to try to expedite that. Not, not at the cost of safety. Absolutely not the cost of safety. No one wakes up and wants to do something un unsafe in that environment. But there is other technology today and to try to get that through to, uh, to you know, expedite uh, that inspection in a much more efficient way is uh, something that would be very valued by uh, the freight rails, the passenger rail in the country, and not at the expense of, of, of safety. Well, to analogize it, it's, it's kind of like uh, the regulatory system we have in, at the state and federal level is often, uh, if you analogize it to banking, it's still forcing the individual to walk up to a teller and hand a paper deposit slip to someone to make a bank deposit or withdrawal. And, and yet we all, most of us do our banking electronically today. We don't walk up to the teller, but the regulatory pattern is we're still making applicants and, and commercial uh, vendors uh, and applicants to government walk up to the teller. So, absolutely. Switching gears a little bit on, on investments, let's talk a little bit about uh, private investment and how it can play a, a role in, in expediting these projects. Well, I just think that, I mean, uh, public-private uh, or private investment um, and then obviously public-private partnerships, um, I mean, the opportunity there is just incredible. And a lot of it is, um, you know, to facilitate that, I, I think it's more or less trying to get government out of the way um, to be able to, to kind of open up that, the floodgates that, that I think those investments would pour in. Now, part of that is providing certainty. Um, you know, it is uh, in the role that government has when, uh, when we do continued resolutions that, um, you know, that's just piecemeal. There's no long-term certainty. And we know that infrastructure investment in particular is, is such a long-term gain. And so you need to know that 
in the out years that uh, whatever that backstop is the government is doing, whether it's assuring that there's um, the permits are going to be in place, whether it's the investments, dollars that are put in place, uh, they need, you know, I, you know, I don't think we're going to really, we really need to provide that, that certainty from, from a government person, from the government perspective, what the government is bringing to the table. And, um, and we haven't, uh, we haven't done a very good job of that with, uh, um, when we're unable to, to do, um, uh, either, uh, where we get caught up in containing resolutions or, or where our, our infrastructure authorizations is short term. Uh, I would I would say if you look at uh, certain P3 projects, bring private capital in. You got to have a, a project that's going to generate revenue in order to get the return for the private investors. Um, maybe we could look at things like if if the government did or a public authority, say the Port Authority of New York, New Jersey, or another public authority, if they do a P3 project to incentivize it, the government, the federal government, might give say a 10% bonus. So if you do a P3 project that might be uh, a billion dollar project, say, on one of these mega projects, maybe the federal government gives them an incentive to do that by granting a hundred uh, billion dollars, hundred million dollars on that billion dollar project. As it incent incentivized the private sector and the state governments to create the environment and the legal regime whereby they'll have an incentive, a financial incentive from Washington, and it's, it's, then they're not coming to Washington saying, oh, give us 700 million for our billion dollar project. If you have a P3 where you have a revenue source, maybe the gov federal government incentivizes that billion dollar project by saying, you do a billion dollar P3 at the state level, we'll give you a uh, hundred million dollars as an incentive. Maybe we, we, re, uh, we recapture the, uh, re, re, repatriate the assets of U.S. corporations overseas by, by saying, okay, you bring that, those dollars back, you in, invest them in a 10-year infrastructure bond, and after 10 years, that money is back tax-free as an incentive to bring those dollars home. Do something that will incentivize, get private capital that's sitting on the sidelines, off the sidelines and here. And you know what? We're still the United States of America. This is the best place in the world to invest. So there are a lot of foreign investors who might be incentivized to come here if we create the right uh, regulatory regime to do it. So those are the approaches that I would take. I think that, look, everyone comes to Washington and a lot of taxpayers think there's a magic wand. A lot of people think it's, it's, it's easy. It isn't. If it was easy, they would have done it already. You know, the money, look at the difficulty Congress has had for years on the Highway Trust Fund. You know, it, so we've got to come up with innovative ways of bringing private capital in and do it in a way that's smart for taxpayers. Absolutely. And from, you know, from an agency perspective, the, you know, if, it, if you're under CRs, it's really, really difficult to, to make the commitments into the, to get the projects done. Absolutely. Uh, you know, whether it's replacing a, a bridge, a highway bridge, or a rail bridge, uh, you know, those are large, can be large projects, and, and if you don't know what the next cycle of funding is going to be, so there's, a, there's definitely uh, an importance to have that, that commitment. I've been advised we have a hard stop at 9.15, so I'm going to use the rest of the, the time to maybe take some questions from, from the audience. Right over here, this, this lady. Right there. There you go. The microphone. Thank you. Um, I'm Virginia McAllister with Iron Horse Architects. We're a small business that specializes in aviation and transportation. And I have two questions um, based on what you guys brought up today. The first one is um, the regulations were put in place to do certain things. And when you um, take a lot of animals off the, the endangered species list, is that because they were protected and now they're no longer in danger, which means the regulations worked? And how are the regulations that you're taking away going to continue to protect the citizens of the United States in health and welfare? And the second one is, how are you guys looking at the connection between this huge tax break that you're creating and trying to finance all of these infrastructure projects? Because if you take major corporations and you have them pay 24% less tax, there isn't going to be any incentive to use things like tax and increment financing 
to finance some of these larger projects. So I really like the idea of bringing money back um, for bonding and having it be tax-free. Um, but if somebody's paying 3% in Europe, why would they come back and pay 15% here in the United States? And I understand that we can't have people pay 3%, but what can we do to actually get these projects financed? Well, I think on the, uh, on the permitting side, you know, Part of it, as uh, as my colleague had mentioned, I mean, how many permits, how, mu how many permits are crisis management that are shoot from the hip, uh, feel good, uh, legislative or executive branch action as a result of one incident, um, as opposed to really looking doing a root cause analysis and, and and look at what was the systemic breakdowns? Do we need to to create excessive permitting? in order to prevent this from occurring again. I would argue many times if we really took the emotions and the politics out of it, the answer would be no. Um, and so doing that, that review of, uh, as uh, my colleague had suggested, I think is a, is a really good idea. Um, the other thing is looking at what works. Um, you know, what you had mentioned specifically endangered species, that's something I work on a lot within the Natural Resource Committee. Uh, quite frankly, the, the, uh, the punitive approach, which uh, really is has created uh, endangered more jobs than saved species just does not work as well to, to any close even close to the collab than the collaborative voluntary conservation approach so part of it may be methodology that's utilized to to approach that I don't think anybody's looking to do anything to um, to jeopardize health safety um, just the efficiency, I would come back to the word concurrent, being able to move things all at once uh, so that all the parties involved, the efficiency in that, the, the cost savings in that in terms of uh, avoiding the inflationary cost of construction, construction projects. And on, on the tax side, uh, you, you raise a good concern about the deficit. And, um, you know, I, I've been a skeptic, for instance, of the border adjustment. I can understand the rationale for it. But when I was in the state legislature years ago in New York, I used to say that uh, we pass a lot of laws, but the law we pass most frequently is the law of unintended consequences. And the unintended consequences and the unforeseen impacts of something like border adjustment, I'm not sure have been fully contemplated and thought through. But on the larger issue of the corporate tax rate, if you just look at U.S. competitiveness vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the world, 35 percent, and recognizing that a lot of companies aren't paying 35 percent because of other exemptions and, and uh, loopholes that, that exist in the system. If we can streamline the system and bring a, a lower rate, and I think 15 is probably too far, but if it's in the low 20s, I think that it, it does a lot to improve our competitiveness. Uh, but we always have to be mindful of the unintended consequences of these things and as people develop investment patterns and uh, uh, market approaches based upon existing tax structures, it, when you change it, all of a sudden things happen. And so we have to be mindful of that. At the same time, we have to be cognizant of the fact that if you're just doing something for tax reasons, it's probably not a good thing overall to benefit the country. So simpler, flatter, streamlined taxation, I think, would be better for the U.S. generally. Getting there is always the rub. Okay. Do we have time for one more? Or? Yeah, but a quick question would be fine. Yeah, I'm a U.S. company, and I think I'm also the infrastructure developer. Uh, you just mentioned about the uh, foreign investment, and the day I'm interested in that is a uh, if you have, for, what's your attitude towards a foreign investment into infrastructure in the United States because our deficits so much? And the second thing I would say, say if you have a, one foreign investors, and then uh, you can compete with other foreign investors, how, you, how what's your, your procedures to do that? That's right. Well, um, just broadly, let me just say, you know, I think that we, uh, one of the, one of our problems has been we've not been we want America to be a place that is uh, um, where everyone is eager to invest in the United States as has uh, been mentioned earlier this is still I think the best place in the world to make an investment and 
Um, and so we should look at our, our processes and, and do whatever we can to incentivize investment here in the country. Uh, our citizens benefit, the economy grows. When you're talking about transportation, transportation investments have always, it, not just the construction and the investments, but just the more efficient flow of, of people and commerce uh, result in a more robust economy as well. And so, it, you know, I think we certainly, um, I would think we ought to pursue policies to, to encourage both domestic and foreign investment here in the United States. We want this a place where, where the world wants to invest. I'm not sure we're quite there with our tax rate and our regulatory regime and, and a few, uh, and, and quite frankly, I put, uh, uh, in our, uh, uh, our manpower. Uh, we have uh, one of the things, one of the best things I think we can do for all of your, all of your companies is to, is to, uh, is to change the, the paradigm in terms of career and technical education training. Because I would argue no matter what your business is, uh, your number one asset is a qualified and trained workforce. And, and we're not there right now in the United States. We've unfortunately, career and technical education has taken a, uh, has had the stigma for almost generations now, not just decades. And uh, we are looking to change that. I, 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 I lead, I, I, I co-chair the Career and Technical Education Caucus, great bipartisan caucus. Jim Langevin from Rhode Island is my co-chair. And, and a lot of Republicans and Democrats both on there. We did have a bill that, that actually passed out of the House uh, last fall, uh, 405 to 5. Um, and nothing uh, of that magnitude passes in that such a bipartisan way. In fact, it was so bipartisan, I, after the vote, I kind of stepped back and wondered where I screwed up in, in the legislation. But the fact is, it's just like this organization, that what you're doing here, we brought all the key stakeholders to the table. In fact, there's companies here that were at the table on the, the uh, career and technical education for the 21st century bill. Now, we had one particular senator who's a friend of mine from West Virginia, West Virginia. He had kind of a burn in the saddle regarding uh, uh, coal miner health benefits, which I agree with the issue, but he put a hold on everything at the end of the year, which just means uh, that I'll be reintroducing that bill in the next couple of weeks, and we're going to get this done because, and, and at the heart of it is bringing you to the table. You know, changing career and technical education so the business and industries, job creators, those who have the in-demand positions that you need to fill are at the table to help guide what type of training that we offer and invest in. And I'm not just talking for kids in secondary education. Uh, this, the Perkins Act serves adults at any age. And so I think that when it comes to infrastructure, and, and I, so I appreciate the opportunity to really mention it, um, your number one asset isn't necessarily the government. We may be the biggest liability, um, <laughs> but it is, I think, a qualified <coughs> the workforce. So. Well, I'll, I'll let GT's comments uh, suffice for me as well, and just tell you, if you want to invest in upstate New York, please uh, talk to me after this. <laughs> Pennsylvania's a great place, too. <laughs>